I remember how excited I was before I was done. I couldn't sleep for nights. I finally chose number 12. I guess that's everybody's favorite. You're traveling to another dimension. Our Twilight Zone Review Marathon continues with another trip to a creepy dystopian future. Which makes me wonder, are there any futures in sci-fi that aren't creepy? Then again, where would the fun be in that? Today we'll be discussing Number 12 Looks Just Like You. This was episode 17 from season 5. It was written by John Tarmelin and directed by Abner Bieberman. And this particular tale was based on a 1952 short story titled The Beautiful People by veteran Twilight Zone writer Charles Beaumont. As always, spoilers are ahead. Given the chance, what young girl wouldn't happily exchange a plain face for a lovely one? What girl could refuse the opportunity to be beautiful? For want of a better estimate, let's call it the year 2000. At any rate, imagine a time in the future when science has developed the means of giving everyone the face and body he dreams of. It may not happen tomorrow, but it happens now in the Twilight Zone. Number 12 Looks Just Like You is a shining example of Twilight Zone at its best. All out sci-fi that takes us to a different time and place. This world may not seem immediately recognizable, but it still manages to tackle topics which are just as relevant today as they were back when this aired in 1964. Number 12 Looks Just Like You is a compelling story about a society where all young adults go through a process known as the transformation, a complete body overhaul, as chosen from a selection of numbered models. Now, if you were to ask anyone in this future society what they think about the transformation, most would smile and declare it the best thing in the world. It's like getting a new hairstyle or new clothes or something. You just look better. However, if you were to ask Marilyn Coverley, as played by Colin Wilcox, then you'd get a very different response. Mother, if I didn't want the transformation, I wouldn't have to have it, would I? Darling, what are you talking about? Marilyn's desire to remain herself stands in sharp contrast to all the blissful, smiling people in this society who cure their negative feelings with cups of instant smile. A glass of instant smile for Marilyn, please, Grace. You may remember Colin Wilcox from her role in the Academy Award-winning film To Kill a Mockingbird. And horror fans may recognize her from Jaws 2. I have had some experience with sharks. What have you? In terms of lead performances, I'd say this is one that ranks right up there with the best in a Twilight Zone series. Wilcox is perfect in this depiction of a young woman who just wants to retain her true self in the face of overwhelming opposition. Marilyn, your father was transformed. We learn that Marilyn's feelings on this matter were influenced by her father, who she was very close with. He has since passed away, but in this world, he was considered radical or nonconformist simply because he encouraged reading and spoke with her about the importance of individuality. Watching everyone around Marilyn try to convince her to move forward with the procedure is frustrating. She seems to have nobody on her side. We see the pressure mainly coming from her mother, Mrs. Coverley. Lana, pardon me, Lana. But we also see the pressure from her uncle and even her closest friend, Valerie. Well, you like the way I look, don't you? I like you, Val. We're friends. I liked you before the transformation. Now, none of these people are outright forceful. Instead, they take a more subtle approach. And this is one area in which the TV adaptation differs from the short story. But I'll come back to that. There's a lot this episode gets right. First off, there's the bizarre setting. Despite the restricted budget, there's still enough here to give a sense of this world. There are glimpses of some futuristic tech and decor, but the true highlight are the citizens of this dystopia, although they're not exactly lifelike. Everyone here feels very cold and artificial, and obviously that's the point. Marilyn feels like the only actual human being in this distorted landscape, and her struggle is something that keeps you rooting for her. What you need is a glass of instant smile. The cast here is very notable. Susie Parker and Pam Austin played almost all of the female roles and Richard Long plays all of the male roles. This is fitting because these particular faces are the most popular models for the transformation. But how does everyone avoid the confusion of seeing the same faces over and over? Name tags. Boom. See? They have it all figured out. What's so terrible about being beautiful? After all, isn't everybody? 
In the case of Susie Parker, William Frog, the show's producer, stated that she was the most famous model in America at the time. So it made sense to feature her in a show centered on everyone looking as beautiful as possible. The use of split screen and models was seamless. Unless you're aware of it, you'd never think it's actually the same actress in the same scene. Anyway, despite Marilyn's protests, Mrs. Coverly... Lana. <clears throat> Lana can't seem to understand why her daughter would choose to remain herself. So she takes her to a doctor. She looks at herself and she's horrified. Isn't that so? Of course. This scene works on many levels. We get to explore the world a bit more. And it becomes clear, Marilyn is basically viewed as being broken by the members of this future society. Now just hold your head very still, please. This won't hurt a bit. On a side note, we also see Lana may be on a lookout for husband number 10. Speaking of the doc, he's yet another unpleasant person, but I admit, the way he continually puts his pinky finger in his mouth cracks me up. It reminds me of Dr. Evil. It's such a quirky mannerism, but it helps distinguish him from the other characters he plays. Who are you? Sit down, please. After Dr. Rex fails to make progress convincing Marilyn to undergo the transformation, she sends to Professor Sig. This is where the story takes a darker turn. We learn that scientists were tasked with finding a way to eliminate injustice and inequality. Their solution was to eliminate ugliness and make everyone beautiful. This world in which the state is all-powerful and citizens have been relegated to smiling Ken and Barbie dolls is the end result. And as we saw in the episode The Obsolete Man, this is yet another example of a state banning books, which serves to highlight the need for total control over the minds of their citizens. Have you ever read Shakespeare? Ooh. Or Keats or Shelley, Aristotle, Socrates? Did you know that Dostoevsky was an epileptic? He was ugly, he was deformed, but he wrote about beauty. This is enough. The introduction of smut into this interview would not help your case, young lady. Sadly, Marilyn is confined to the hospital. And with that, we begin to sense the inevitable. Oh, mother, they're going to do it anyway. They're going to make me do it anyway. In the most gut-wrenching moment of the episode, Marilyn pours out her heart and reveals her father took his own life. When they took away his identity, he had no reason to go on living. Unfortunately, Val is completely incapable of understanding, or even offering basic sympathy. Life is pretty, life is fun. I am all and all is one. <laughs> you can't understand, can you? Throughout the episode, we've seen Marilyn surrounded by smiling faces. But in truth, she's totally alone. Eventually, Marilyn attempts to escape from the hospital. And I found myself hoping maybe she'd get away somehow. However, she ends up in the exact last place she wants to be, the operating room. Lana, Val, you're just in time, just in time. It's all over, Doc. All over. In the closing moments, Dr. X comments that some people have problems with the idea of the transformation, but improvements to the procedure guarantee a positive result. With that, we get yet another of the more dark endings in the series, as Marilyn reappears, and she's essentially a cheery duplicate of our friend Valerie. The nicest part of all, Val, I look just like you. Portrait of a young lady in love, with herself. Improbable? Perhaps. But in an age of plastic surgery, bodybuilding, and an infinity of cosmetics, let us hesitate to say impossible. So there we have it. Number 12 looks just like you. This is certainly one of the more grim tales in the series, and I think overall this is a story that probably raises more questions than it answers. The obsession with unobtainable beauty standards is something we can all relate to at some level. Over time, the high standards of beauty have remained on full display in film, television, and advertising. Plus, we have social media in the mix. That's yet another way for this issue to creep into our everyday lives. Clearly, this is an issue that makes you think, does changing your appearance alter your personality and outlook on life? And in the end, is this preoccupation with beauty and perfection destructive to your identity? Why does everyone want to force me to do something I don't want to do? <laughs> but for your own good, why yes? Obviously, the world presented in the show is one of extremes. This society is dominated by the state and has already fallen into conformity. Anyone that rebels suffers the consequences. Case in point, it would seem Marilyn wasn't just given a new body, her mind has been wiped. Mother! Val! Look 
at me. There's nothing left of who this young woman was. But in this one horrific final twist, we explore just how far things can go in a world like this. I also wonder, if Marilyn really has had her mind wiped, has that happened to others as well? I mean, look at the vacant expressions on some of these people. They're like walking examples of the uncanny valley. Plus, there's that phrase Valerie mindlessly repeats. Life is pretty, life is fun. I am all and all is one. As noted by Mark Scott Zickery, this episode definitely works as a companion piece to the iconic episode, The Eye of the Beholder. But similarities aside, number 12 looks just like you, it's very much its own unique tale. Lastly, I wanted to discuss The Beautiful People by Charles Beaumont. In the short story, Marilyn, who is known as Mary, also refuses the transformation. But we learn even more odd things about this world. Somehow, humans no longer eat or even sleep. In fact, sleep is described as a wasteful state of unconsciousness that's been conquered. So, the implication is these people are even more artificial and unnatural than they appear to be in the show. The mother in the short story is also significantly more cold-hearted, flat out calling her daughter ugly. We also see their lives are made difficult by Mary's refusal to undergo the transformation. She's fired from her job, and her mother speaks of people no longer visiting their home, and even claiming her daughter belongs in a circus. I think some of these additions may have been interesting to see in the show. In the conclusion of the short story, we don't get to see the aftermath of her transformation. But the tale still ends on a grim note. As a large machine hurtles down toward Mary and sticks her with the needle, she cries out, Where will I find me when it's all over? In any case, the tragedy of this story is the desire for perfection has taken us so far over the edge, we've lost everything that made us human to begin with. And that's a rather bleak and unsettling thought. You know what I think? You don't feel very well. What you need is a nice cup of instant smile. I'll see you. No thanks. Number 12 Looks Just Like You is obviously yet another classic episode I highly recommend. I'd rate it 4 out of 5 cups of instant smile. Okay, that's it for me. If you've seen this one and have your own thoughts on the show, feel free to drop a comment below. And don't forget, hit like and sub. Thanks so much, guys. Until next time, stay safe, be well, later.